welcome to episode five of Coffee with Keith. My name is Amy Gruber and I'm the Director of Enrollment Management at TASIS Portugal. Uh, and this evening, Keith will be introducing two more of our wonderful teachers. Uh, as a reminder, you are invited to submit questions and you can do so using that function right on the screen. It has a question mark in it. We will take those questions at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I will send it over to Keith. Thank you, Andrea. Welcome to Coffee with, oh, this isn't gonna work. Sorry, I was trying to uh, cover my mouth and hide my hair. Welcome to week five of Coffee with Keith. We're uh, sending this message from our studio deep in the bowels of the Tassas Portugal campus. So thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, we are quickly amassing quite a presence on YouTube in case you haven't noticed. Um, last week we had our biggest audience ever. We had 125 computers, uh, discrete computers. That means at least 125 viewers. And uh, we recognize that this isn't the best time to be broadcasting our coffee with Keith because 7 p.m. I understand is dinner time for most, most people in Portugal. See, I'm from Canada, so we tend to eat very much earlier so we can take advantage of any daylight hours in the winter and, of course, watch hockey all night. Um, I'm going to tell you a few uh, things tonight that might be slightly provocative. The first one uh, may upset a few of you, while others might be envious, but this weekend I'm getting a haircut. And uh, our hairdresser, Esther, is coming to our house to cut our hair. And so if you send me an email uh, with access to your bank account, I will send you Esther's phone number. OK, for those of you who continue to tune in, I say thank you. We are doing this webinar series to keep in touch with our families, our faculty, our students, and anybody interested in TASAS Portugal. We plan to continue to uh, have our Thursday webinar until sometime in June, probably, or until you stop watching. Each week we meet families who want a great fit uh, for their children. They want, we meet children who want a great school so they can thrive uh, and where they can be themselves. Last week, I had a parent write me after she told her son uh, that she had enrolled him in TASIS and he said to her, thank you, mom. So this is unique, not only because 12 year olds rarely thank their parents, but also because 12 can be a tough time to make new friends at a new school. And so I applaud both uh, the courage and the manners of this young man, whose name is Max. Had another family asked me last week, a number of questions, I would say the number is about a thousand, while they were submitting their application. And I thought it was really great when they said to me, please forgive all the questions, but we didn't even know to ask these questions uh, at our current school before we enrolled, and now we realize we should have. Well, that was a great reflection. Thanks for sharing that. Before I introduce our guests, I'm going to answer a few of the more frequently asked questions over the last four or five weeks. First of all, uh, interest in the school has been very robust, especially over the last two months. We expect to open our school with between 150 and 180 students. We actually have more applications for some grade levels than we have spaces. So if you're still considering TASIS, we'd love to meet you. Please contact our admissions office uh, sooner than later. We are likely to add another pre-kindergarten class if demand continues the way it has. Secondly, we're, we've been asked, is the construction on schedule? We're asked this almost daily and I can report. I did a walkthrough of the building today and I have been told it continues to be on schedule. So that is good news. We were also asked if we have a, a backup plan. We have many backup plans. If the building for whatever reason is not ready, we will either bring in portable buildings for a week or two. Uh, we will utilize some of the, sh the building that we're not currently building out in phase one and develop those classroom spaces in August if we need to. We have uh, two alternate sites that we've looked at and talked to the landowners about, so we have a place to go should we need to. That would be option three, of course, because it's off campus. And option four, should the government shut schools again, we will have a very organized and robust plan for online learning. 
The next question we frequently get is, what is your curriculum? And I, I want to uh, take a moment just to talk about the curriculum that we are offering at this school. I've talked to, to most parents about it, but I think there's some confusion. We are an American school in that our founder was American, and she founded the first American boarding school in Europe. But America doesn't have a curriculum per se. Every state has their own curriculum. Schools have their own curriculum in those states. Private independent schools have different curricula than public schools, and there are different standards. So no school truly has an American curriculum. Um, but we have a curriculum that we have done a lot of research on, which happens to emanate from an American scholar and research group called the Core Knowledge Curriculum. And that is in our preschool through grade five. In our middle school, which will be grade six through grade nine, we have, uh, sorry, six through eight, we have the Cambridge curriculum. So that is a uh, British curriculum. And then we will have the IGCSE curriculum in grades nine and 10, again, finishing off with the British international curriculum. And then our last two years will be the international baccalaureate. So we have many different curricula because we've we think we've picked the best curriculum for each level in preparation for the IB program. And I've answered lots of questions about that in the past, but I'm happy to answer more. How many years will it take to build out the school completely? And that we're not sure of because it will depend in part on our demand, but we want to grow the school at a rate that can guarantee we stay intimate with our families. We can provide the highest quality of education to our students, we can continue to recruit the best teachers, uh, and also that we can have a construction schedule that doesn't impair our ability to deliver a great program. But probably, based on what we know, somewhere between three and five years before the school is completely built out, uh, we don't have students going into our senior school, which will be grades 9, 10, 11 for a few years. So we've, uh, sorry, 10, 11, 12 for a few years. So we've got some time and we want to do it thoughtfully. We are intending to build the second portion of the school, that is phase B, starting sometime uh, after we launch this school year, sometime in the, in the six months after September. But we'll maintain the construction, we'll be safe, we'll have uh, confined areas, it'll be isolated, insulated, soundproof, et cetera. Well, those are the questions I've been getting a lot. Uh, we've got lots of time for questions tonight. I want to uh, acknowledge a few students who have been sending me video texts with suggestions for our school mascot. So thanks to Sammy, Emily, Nelson, Danny, Tito, and Matias. Thank you uh, for all of your suggestions, your, your very compelling videos. And I, all I can tell you at this point is the Tassis Knights are leading the vote count, but we're not making decisions today. So you still have time to send more suggestions. Uh, those are very cute. Last week I had the pleasure of introducing our math and our science and coding teachers, Isabella Boutros and John Iglar. Isabella will work with grades four through seven in science and John with kindergarten through grade seven to develop our coding and robotics programs. Um, I've interviewed hundreds of teachers in my time. And at the end of it all, it comes down to three things. Number one, do they know their craft? That is, are they experienced professionals? Number two, do they demonstrate a growth mindset and a desire to continue to improve at what they're doing as professionals and continue to learn? And thirdly, what I want these people in charge of my own children. If they get any one of these right, I hire them. No, I'm kidding. The next two gentlemen answered all three of those with flying colors. I'd like to introduce our guest tonight, Sergio Franslin. Sergio was a bit nervous, I have to tell you, to join us tonight because um, he's worried his English isn't as strong as it could be. But of course, he's our Portuguese instructor. So I asked him, your Portuguese is OK, though, right? He's, he's assured me it is. Uh, Sergio has a degree in modern languages and a master's degree in Portuguese studies. He's also the coordinator of the Project Apollo, which is a child mythology and literature club, and the Clarnardus Association which is for the promotion of teaching of classical culture and languages. Sergio has been teaching for 18 years. He's published, he's a published author of numerous essays, poetry and children's books, as well as a Latin scholar. Sergio's references tell us he is the finest Portuguese teacher in the country. 
Of course, that reference came from his mother, but it was good enough for us. Uh, Bill Brooks, our other guest, is currently residing in Wisconsin, United States. He and his family just returned from Guangzhou, China in February after their school, the American International School of Guangzhou, closed due to the COVID virus. You met Bill's wife, Heather, two weeks ago. Heather will be one of our grade one teachers. Bill has worked in international schools for the past six years, the last two in China, and before that, four years in Qatar. He has also taught in the United States. He has experience as a curriculum coordinator, an IB examiner, a technical director for theater productions, and is adept with technology. Like all of our tasks as teachers, Bill is a qualified teacher. He holds a teaching qualification. He has a master's degree, uh, a bachelor's degree, and a master's degree in English literature. Uh, Bill, and Hella, uh, Bill and Heather will um, join us with their three children in August. So I have a few introductory questions before we take questions from the field. Um, and I will ask both gentlemen the following question. Well, first of all, for Bill, why TASIS? Why TASIS Portugal? And then for Sergio, I'm going to ask, why should people want to come to Portugal? So Bill, you start, please. Thanks, Keith. Um, for our family, we had had an eye on TASTIS Portugal um, from its beginning um, because we were familiar with TASTIS schools. Um, being international teachers, we followed the news closely and um, we applied as quickly as we could once we heard TASTIS was opening up a school in Portugal. And for us, TASTIS, um, why TASTIS really comes down to a couple of main things. One is, um, as Heather mentioned before, when she was on a few weeks back, we really felt valued as a family as part of the TASIS community. Um, Keith made it very clear to us that as newly hired teachers, our children would also be an important part of the community. And that matters a lot to us because when we come to a school, we come to a school as a whole family. And one other part of that that really attracted us to TASIS Portugal is the the hopes of building a really strong community around um, not just the students and teachers at TASIS Portugal, but also the community of parents and other um, other people in the community that will get involved with our students' education as well too. That community aspect is, is a very important part to us and we hope to build a strong and supportive community as part of the teaching staff, as part of the founding family as well too. Great, thank you, Bill, appreciate that. Sergio? You've lived in Portugal most of your life. Why should why should Bill and, and Heather and all of our teachers from overseas want to come and live in Portugal? Oh, Sergio, you might be muted. First, I, I want to, to say that for me, it's a great honor to be part of Tazi's family. Why should people come to Portugal? It's, uh, it is not difficult to answer that question. I love Portugal. Uh, I'm proud to be Portuguese. Indeed, I am one uh, Portuguese that love our history, our culture. Portugal is uh, one of the oldest nations of Europe that had great kings, sailors, writers. Uh, was the Portuguese who started at the end of the middle, middle age, the discovers the, the, the discovers that unite the world. Who come to Portugal will find one country uh, with nice courage and uh, resilient uh, persons. Um, over the centuries, Portugal's people was strong, and because of that, we still independent, and we are a country with great history. Bill, we love Portugal. Uh, the people are nice, the country has, has a beautiful place like Sintra and the food is so good. Uh, and the language that Portuguese speak is one of the most beautiful Latin language. Thank you for that, Sergio. Uh, I can certainly attest we've been in Portugal for the last nine months and everything you've said about the country and the people is absolutely accurate. Bill, a uh, question for you. Why English? Why literature? And this question is going to get asked, I'm sure, by one of our students, but which book have you read the most number of times? Good questions. 
Um, first of all, Eng I think English and language and literature for me have always been something that is deeply personal, but also very, very public at the same time. And as I've grown into a teacher, I see being able to help students learn to read and write is really about giving students access um, and a way to assess, uh, to assess the information that's coming into them uh, from many different outlets in the information age that we live in. And so I feel like being an English teacher is a way to give students tools to really do the best they can and present themselves the best and give themselves every opportunity going forwards. I first thought about being an English teacher in eighth grade actually um, as I was sitting in the back of one of my eighth grade English classes thinking about how I might run a discussion and I think that's what I enjoy the most is um, helping students learn how to talk about texts and um, how to try things out and how to share their ideas and and also how to be um, convincing when it's the right time to do maybe a little more persuasive speaking um, or how to build on each other's ideas when we're just trying to have dialogue and understand a text together. The question about a book is a good one. I actually I'm not a I'm not a big rereader of books, but I do like to reread poetry and drama a lot. I think I think the text I've read the most is Macbeth, partly because I've taught it, but I have also I've read it as many times for school as I or for work as I have um, just on my own as well too. I mean, I really enjoy that text, um, but if I had to pick a favorite book, one that I have reread a few times, it would actually be uh, the book Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And I say that for a couple of reasons. I really enjoy the time period. Um, there's kind of a there's a story behind the creation of a story where Mary Shelley was going around um, Lake Geneva area with a couple of other really well known writers and they sort of challenged each other to kind of a ghost writing uh, ghost story writing competition and she really just won. She did a really great job with Frankenstein um, and it's it's a story that asks us to really think about our responsibility with what we create um, It asks us to question preconceptions or prejudices that we might have um, and it's just a really great story um, and actually it's at some points it's a story within a story within a story and I, I think that the way that she crafted the story was really fascinating but when I teach middle school I also read a lot of what my students read and so um, in my most current job we were lucky enough to have Brandon Mull come to our school and um, he's written books like Dragon Watch and The Beyonders and I really get into any of the books that my students are reading and I'll pick up on their suggestions and I'll just read alongside them as well. Thank you, Bill. Great answer. Uh, and listen, don't be too hard on yourself. I too have spent a lot of time and energy trying to understand Macbeth. Um, now, That's one of the reasons we hired you obviously is because you have such passion for the subject area. And speaking of passion, Sergio, you too, uh, beyond being a, a Portuguese scholar, love the classics. So can you talk a little bit about your interest in Latin and uh, classical studies? I, I like teaching Portuguese, of course, but uh, my passion is uh, classical studies. I love uh, Greek Roman mythology, uh, gods, monster gods, and the classical culture. It's so important for us to meet our soul uh, or cultural soul. Uh, philosophy, theater, policy, and uh, so many themes come from the ancient Greece and the ancient Roman. And uh, our language has so much of the this uh, la ancient language. Normally, uh, I say to my students that uh, I am Portuguese, Greek, and Roman. Uh, and because of my passion, I'm I'm going to de develop. Uh, one of uh, one club for Tazi students to meet uh, the monsters, the gods, the uh, the heroes um, that's still present uh, in our culture in so many ways. Um, besides that, in the club, uh, we are also going uh, uh, to work and learn some uh, um, Latin because Portuguese is a Latin language. And uh, without uh, Latin, uh, without Latin, we can't uh, understand, uh, for example, the logo of Tazis that uh, has uh, three Latin words, verum, bonum, pulcrum. Uh, verum means true, bono means god goodness, 
and pulcrum means beauty. In Portuguese, verdade, bondade e beleza. Nicely answered. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, while you're on the topic, Sergio, why don't you continue and tell us about some of your publications. You've published uh, more than 25 essays, uh, poetry and, and uh, nonfiction and fiction books. Can you talk a bit about what your passion for writing is and why children's books? Uh, I love teaching. I love write in Portuguese, of course. Uh, one day I will try write one book in English but in the future. Um, my first books uh, were for adults, but uh, a few years ago I had a need to talk about uh, something, uh, something that I talked to every year in the, the beginning of the classes, rules for classrooms. So uh, I, so I saw, saw cre uh, to create a history to talk about that with my students, uh, I create a character called, in Portuguese, Sebastião Afilapic. In English, it's uh, Sebastian Pencil Sharpner. Uh, with uh, Sebastian, I wrote uh, uh, one history uh, with uh, the title A Cidade dos Sonhos, in English, The Cities of Dreams. Since the, that first book, I have uh, written for kids, but now uh, I'm working in the new Potter's volume and uh, in one of the Templar's Knights and uh, Portugal. And I think you shared that with me. So thank you, Sergio. Appreciate it. Um, we're looking forward to having you here teaching our faculty and staff more about the history of Portugal, of course, the Roman influence on Portugal. And uh, maybe if you're nice to Bill, he'll help you write that English book. OK, last question for both of you. And Sergio, you can answer yours in Portuguese if you want. But my question is, if I were to walk into your classroom on any given day, uh, what would it look like? What would I see? Uh, would... A typical class. Um, first, uh, um, the, in the beginning, when I, uh, uh, before I, I start to teach, I try to uh, connect with uh, the students. Um, because we need to establish uh, a connection. During the class, I work uh, for students to have a critical sense, uh, which, uh, which uh, is so important in learning. And uh, I always try to wake up the curiosity in the students, um, because a curious student is an, an attentive student, and these students will learn uh, more easy, easily. Thank you, Sergio. I always said a curious student is a dangerous student, but you have a different philosophy. <laughs> OK, Bill, uh, how about your classroom? Um, a typical class in English might look different from day to day. We'll utilize things like a workshop approach to uh, especially to writing, but also to reading when appropriate as well. And what that means maybe for parents or students who aren't familiar is that a workshop approach for writing give students opportunities to write in this in the class period and receive feedback on the given topic that same day. Um, a trainer that we had to come into my current school put it in a good way. They said that in math class, you wouldn't just learn a particular operation um, like um, a lesson on fractions and then not practice with the whole class. Of course, you would you would practice with multiple problems again and again and get feedback and then um, perfect your practice over time. So in writing focus days like that, a workshop approach allows a teacher to give a discrete um, or very specific teaching points and then give students examples, different opportunities to practice and work with each other and then to go off and try it on their own. And part of that also involves conferencing on any given day, whether it's a writing workshop day or a reading day or a day where maybe I have more of um, a deliver um, a teacher's um, teacher delivered lesson, um, you'll still see students getting conferencing from me and so I'll be sitting down um, asking questions of students, seeing where they're at in the process of a writing project um, or seeing what they're doing with reading strategies that we've looked at and getting feedback right then and there. Some other classes might use a strategy called a Socratic seminar um, and there's a slightly different strategy also called a Harkness model or spiderweb discussions. They're variants of something kind of similar. Um, but it, it is a discussion strategy where um, 
teachers lead students into a discussion that builds on a dialogue. It's not a debate, but it's a dialogue that builds understanding um, and shared understanding of a text. And it really encourages students to use strong textual support to back up what they're saying. So during a Socratic seminar day, you would see students all um, possibly in a big circle and speaking with each other. And um, it might not look like I'm doing a lot of work because I myself would sit outside of the circle and be taking notes and observing and giving feedback at appropriate times um, so as not to interrupt the flow of student conversation. It takes a lot of practice um, and it's a little bit uncomfortable for students at first, but once students get up and going, they really take the power to discuss the texts that we're learning in class um, and they make a lot of meaning out of it together with guidance from me as their teacher, of course. Brilliant, thank you, Bill. That's a great explanation. And uh, I wanted to know that those times when it looks like you're not actually doing any work, we won't be paying you for those times. Um, now, Sergio, you probably like what Bill said about the Socratic method, being a Greek scholar. Of course, Plato wrote a lot about Socrates and, and the methodology of, of um, questioning, deep questioning. Do you, is that something you employ as well? Sorry, Kit, I don't hear you well. Can you repeat the question? Uh, it probably wasn't worth repeating. We're going to move on. We're going to open this up to uh, all of our uh, eager students and parents to ask questions of anybody in the group, hopefully more to Bill and Sergio than me, but um, we'll, we'll all take our turn. Send your questions in to Amy and she will then, uh, well, she will now read some of the questions and decide who's to answer them. Amy, over to you. Terrific, thank you so much. Uh, Bill and Sergio, it was lovely to hear from both of you and thank you for your time. Uh, we had one parent of an Early Learning Center student uh, submit questions in advance of the webinar. Not a surprise since she came to the interview with a binder and a very well curated list of questions, which I always love. So she writes, for the Early Learning Center and higher grades, how will the Portuguese language be incorporated into the learning? Some schools employ a method where one teacher speaks English and the other speaks a second language to the kids the whole day. Other schools have a specific time, a specific time of the day, a few times a week when they learn. How will TASIS incorporate Portuguese in the early learning center and in higher grades? So thank, great question, Jennifer. OK, I think it's for me. Um, the, yeah. Portuguese, <laughs> yes, yes. the Portuguese language is going to be very important in our curriculum. Uh, we're going uh, to have Portuguese uh, since uh, kindergarten, uh, four times per week. Uh, we want uh, our students uh, to speak and to write uh, very well the language of the country where we live, um, because we expect to offer to him all possibilities to assess uh, Portuguese university. We are going to have uh, one curriculum for no native speakers and other other for of course for native speakers um, our goal is to give to all the the skill that possibility them to do if they want uh, one course in portuguese but they can choose and uh, choose one course in english because some portuguese universities have english curriculum Thank you, Sergio, for that answer. Uh, and Bill, I'm going to put this next question over to you. Uh, although the parents said that it could be for either of you. So, Andrea, could we move the camera to Bill, please? Um, so the, the parent writes, while reading and the love for books comes naturally for some children, for others, it's more of a challenge, particularly with modern technological distractions. How do you manage to develop the curiosity and passion for reading as well as analysis slash deep thinking? So to critique from the own perspective, any any subject. So, Bill, I think that's right up your alley. That's a that's a wonderful question. I'm so glad that was asked. Um, I'll answer it kind of in two parts. One of the most important parts of getting a student, um, getting a child to learn to love reading has already been said here um, earlier with the grade one team, but it continues through fourth, fifth grade and middle school. 
And really, I think for a teacher, it begins with a teacher getting to know the student as a person and getting to know their interests, their strengths and their challenges um, so that a teacher knows what kinds of tools um, to use to be able to help get a student to a text. Um, there are, I think there are different opinions about having students read what they like to read or reading by interest and then reading classics. And I think that that's a false dichotomy. Um, in our curriculum, we're going to be asking students to do both. We're going to be um, in grades four and five using core knowledge, which has a common um, basis of text that all students will, will read. And so there'll be a um, common outcome for all students to have access to the same text and have that same background knowledge, which will only build and help them in the future. And we will do that. Um, we'll use all kinds of skills and strategies to help students analyze the texts at age appropriate levels, fourth, fifth grade, and then into middle school. Also, um, there will be a lot of work done in a workshop setting for reading to help students explore their interests and know more about themselves as readers to pick texts that are appropriate, appropriately challenging and interesting for them as well too. So it's not a question of either or. Do we read the classics or what kids are interested in? It's actually, it's, it's yes and. Um, and the only other thing I would add about that at this point too is that um, kind of skipping ahead to a question about homework I know was asked last week, um, even now and when next school year starts, we would hope all students are reading 25 or 30 minutes a night every night. And there's a lot of research to show that um, that is one of the single most important things students, uh, children can do to increase and their ability as readers. And whether that reading occurs in English or the home language um, is the choice of the children and parents, but it's more about the repetition of, um, of that reading happening every night. And even a step further, I would say, it's important for parents to model that love of reading at home and to be having conversations with their children about what they're reading. And those conversations, again, it does not matter what language those conversations happen. And if your child happens to be reading something in English and that's not your home language and you're worried about being able to converse about that topic or that text, it's fine. The conversation can happen in the home language if it's if it's just as natural to do so. Bill, I just want to pick up on the research that you mentioned. Uh, the research talks about kids, young kids particularly, reading with their parents because often they can access material that is a little bit perhaps beyond their regular vocabulary range. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think the research suggests that you have to understand at least 90% of the words in a sentence or in a paragraph to understand the context. And so when parents uh, push their kids by reading something that might be slightly above their level, um, it helps young people to develop a greater vocabulary, which is really important because as we learned uh, just last week or with, it was the week before about um, the process involved in reading. First process obviously is decoding these symbols into words, but then also to understand the words, you have to have a context of how that word relates to the rest of the world. And so we spend a lot of time on that obviously on vocabulary because it makes for good reading and, and you've highlighted that. So thank you, Bill. Yes, thank you, Bill, for that question. Uh, and one parent writes, welcome, Sergio and Bill. It is a pleasure to e meet you. Uh, and she wonders, will Portuguese history be in the school's curriculum? If not, will it be embedded in the Portuguese subject? Thank you so much to Tassas for giving us the privilege to meet our children's teachers in these unprecedented times we are all living in. It's most appreciated. And my best wishes and looking forward to the day where we can meet in person. Bill, I'm, I'm going to let I you. I could say a little bit about that. Sorry, Bill. Oh. Let me let me just preface it with with one comment that sure. that's, um, I think our families would be interested in. We are embarking into a new curriculum for most people. The core knowledge curriculum is is a unique curriculum, and it's it's taught at all of the TASA schools, but it's not taught uh, around the world. So many of our teachers have not encountered it. However, we had our first group meeting as a faculty, so all of our teachers who are on board with us, even though they're currently teaching at other schools, um, joined us last night in a webinar with a core knowledge specialist out of the United States, and we spent an hour with her as she explained some of the uh, nuances of the core knowledge curriculum. It was really informative, but importantly, our faculty are already, and this is still April, are already working together 
I know Bill and Sergio, for example, have had many, many email exchanges and conversations about teaching exactly the topic we're talking about uh, tonight, Portuguese, uh, Portuguese history, I should say. So I'll let Bill answer that question, but I wanted parents to know that even though our faculty are coming from uh, all corners of the globe, they're already working together and communicating and we meet as a group at least once a month. Sorry, Bill, over to you. No, thank you. Um, within grades four and five, um, sorry, let me back up. I'll also be teaching um, history as well too. I've, I'm teaching history currently. I really enjoy it and I'll continue to teach some sections of history as well. In looking at the curriculum, um, there are a lot of areas we can include and I think we plan to include Portuguese history um, in place of American history, for example. And we've had, um, I'd like to um, sort of acknowledge the work that Sergio has already done for some of these planning meetings prior to the school year starting, where um, for my own knowledge, I've been trying to read Portuguese um, works of literature in translation, and he's been really on the spot with giving lots of suggestions. The same thing with, with history curriculum. He's been a really good resource to help us know uh, what is important in the schools and the curriculum around Portugal, and he's just been um, so far such a such a very helpful asset to be able to tell us what kinds of ages are covered, um, what are the themes, and what are the topics as well. And so that will be something that we'll be building into the curriculum for history. Um, Sergio, do you have anything to add about that for Portuguese class? Uh, in, sorry, I don't understand your bill. Do you have anything to add about um, his um, Portuguese history in Portuguese class? In Portuguese class, normally when we work some uh, books, uh, uh, normally you, we use uh, some themes. Yes, we will we, we'll, we'll use some themes. And I, I just want to be clear for everybody that, again, if you read my blog about are we an American school, it, it's a question because, as I said, there's no American curriculum per se. Our founder was American and we, uh, I think we embody and endorse many of the American ideals, but at the same time, we are opening a school in Europe, obviously particularly in Portugal, and our students will learn European history and Portuguese history before they learn American history. So uh, we'll cover world history, obviously. So the Second World War, for example, will cover, cover all the countries involved in the war. Uh, interestingly, Portugal was not, but um, we will obviously uh, spend a lot more of our time on European history than we would American history. Thanks, Bill and Sergio, for clarifying that. Yes, thank you both. Uh, and we have a student writing in tonight, and I know that's always one of our favorite things to know that students are watching. Uh, and he wants to know from both uh, Bill and Sergio what your approach will be to your first class. What should he expect the first day that he walks into your classroom? Um, I can start off on this one. One, one thing I've tried that um, was a little bit different than years past was to do away with the kind of typical first day of icebreakers activities and going over the syllabus and expectations. Those things are all very important and we'll get to those. Don't worry. Um, but we tried something different. My co-teacher and I this year from the work of um, a scholar called Alan November, who did something called the first five days of school. And it's kind of a way of looking at doing class differently. But on the first day, um, one thing we tried was having students learn to ask questions and that might sound like an odd way to start the first day of school but basically what you could expect is to come into the class and we'll have some basic introductory activities to get kind of comfortable um, but then we'll start looking at content right away uh, we'll be looking at images we'll be looking at short excerpts of poems in history class we'll be looking at maps and timelines and things like that There'll be all kinds of different um, stimuli or things to look at, and your first job will just be to ask a lot of questions. And from that point, we're going to work on how to categorize our questions and how to prioritize them, how to organize them in different ways. And this is a good entry point. We've received a lot of good feedback from students, my co-teacher and I who use this, because students can kind of get to work right away. And we will get to the rules and the procedures and everything and we'll build our classroom environment. But from day one, we're looking at the content, we're asking questions, we're getting going and the students appreciated the chance to um, kind of try something right away and try something that is kind of low risk. 
it's it's really hard um, really hard to ask a bad question on the first day. And even if you feel like your question isn't the greatest, um, it, they're pretty much it's anonymous. And so when we look through all the questions the class has curated on these different images and texts, um, no one's going to know which question is yours. Um, but in doing so, we're gonna we're gonna help build community. We're gonna learn about each other right away, see what kinds of perspectives people have, and get a jump on um, what is it that we'll learn in this class from day one. Okay. Um, my first class is always to get uh, to know each other, um, but uh, I, I can tell uh, that uh, I am a dedicated teacher that uh, enjoy teaching and uh, enjoys establishing a connection with students. Uh, so I will work in the first class uh, this pro proximity uh, for the students uh, have the confidence to learn and uh, when they trust in teachers, they are not afraid to ask for help and uh, correct mistakes. My first uh, uh, class will be uh, to know each one uh, to each other. Amy, I just I want to I feel compelled to comment because this is not something that I've talked to Bill or Sergio or in fact any of our teachers about, but I've also read Alan November's work and. I've hired people who are absolutely passionate about their subject area, first and foremost, and then about uh, imparting that subject knowledge and, and passion to, to our students. And so when we when we have the first day of class and we do something like cover uh, the logistics of how the class will go or read through something boring like the, the, the summary of, of what we're going to cover in terms of the curriculum and content, or we just do an icebreaker and just have some fun on the first day. Not that you can't do some of that, but that gives students the, the impression that, that we're frivolous with our time, that we have time to waste. And we have so much to do, we don't have time to waste. And good teachers want to impart, as Bill and Sergio just said, you want to impart that we're here to, to learn about something that's going to be really interesting, whether it's Portuguese language, Portuguese history, uh, English literature. These are really important, fascinating subjects. So why would we spend our day doing something other than our subject? at any time. So that, those are great answers. Thank you both. Thank you, Keith. Uh, and this question, I imagine, is one that will resonate with many parents. Our son loves to read and has excellent comprehension, but he's very nervous doing it out loud. Uh, and this family has paid attention and knows that this is part of the, the core knowledge curriculum and, and read alouds. Uh, are used in the classroom and also at home. So he's also asking, you know, for any tips to have a child become a more confident reader out loud. That's a really wonderful question and uh, a very important question for um, fourth, fifth grades and even in, especially through middle school as well too. From the end of a teacher and uh, classroom perspective, something will work really hard to do in the class is to establish um, a sense of belonging for students and safety. And I think that's an important that's an important thing for students to feel and to know is true about their learning environments. Um, coming from my perspective as also being an English language teacher, we need to have students try and we need to have students make mistakes. That's just part of making progress. What we can do to mitigate the effect of students feeling bad about that in class and feeling um, feeling nervous or feeling apprehensive is to build in the expectation that that will happen and that's OK and that we support each other. And so building that safety and a sense of belonging is something that I'll take on as a responsibility of teacher to facilitate and the students will build that and we'll continue to revisit our expectations and our norms over time. And so students in that situation and there are many students in that situation. Sometimes I'm in that situation as well too when I'm reading something aloud. I don't always feel totally confident. Um, we need to trust that we have a class that can support us um, and we know that mistakes will be made. And I would also just add to that too that it's just practice. So practicing in a place that's comfortable, um, maybe where no one is listening and then maybe where it's just a couple of people listening. Or even um, I've had a lot of students use technology to help as well too. They prefer to, um, and I often have students read for fluency into um, apps like just recording on their Macs. Um, or using Flipgrid or other kinds of things like that where they can listen to themselves and listen to their performance. 
I'm going to talk uh, a little about my experience. Um, in the, the last uh, years, I'm working with uh, no native speakers, English, Chinese, uh, American, French, and students of uh, other countries. Uh, to, to learn a language sometimes is difficult, uh, but it's important to talk, to write, to listen, and to do that without fear. Um, my experience with students uh, is to give all the, the trust they need to use uh, the, the language. Uh, one arrow is one way to do better the, the next time. I know that uh, that is true. Uh, my English is not the best and uh, I continue. <laughs> so work uh, with no native speakers is uh, is to give uh, the resilience and confidence the, to those who learn uh, some language. Sergio, I, I want to thank you for di uh, distinguishing between English and American. I, I never <laughs> learned American either. It's a tough language. Um, I want to pick up on something that Bill said, though, because I've said this to parents and I feel very strongly about it. Part of the job of a good school is to help young people develop confidence. <clears throat> As human beings, we're inundated with media that makes us feel less confident every day. And I don't think anybody is wholly confident in almost anything they do. But particularly young people need to be encouraged to try things, to develop the confidence, because courage is so important in our world. If we don't have courageous people, we'll never save this planet. We'll never do anything of value. And so part of our job is to help young people come out of their shell, to develop the confidence that they need. And they develop confidence by doing things. And sometimes they fail at them, but they do them again. And they develop resilience. And through resilience comes confidence because uh, so many of the things we do take a lot of time and effort. And, and good things all take a lot of time and effort, like playing the violin, for example. So that's part of our job. We take it very seriously, and I know both of you do, and all of our teachers have spoken to that. Good question. Thank you. And uh, I'm about to potentially humble myself a little bit here with, with this next question. Uh, and Sergio, I got to count on you to, to help me out here. So Bruno is writing from Germany. He and his wife have this as their date night every Thursday night. So this might be inspired by a glass of wine trying to torture Amy. Uh, so the question is for Sergio. Who's better, Luis de Camoich or Fernando Pichua, Fernando Pichua and why? And if I pronounce those in any way that you can understand, I appreciate it. So, uh, Luis de Camoich or Fernando Pichua? Uh, they are very, very different. Uh, I wish Camões wrote uh, um, a epic uh, book, uh, Os Lusíades, in the uh, 16th century. Um, Fernando Pessoa is a, a poetry of uh, uh, modern. I prefer Fernando Pessoa. Uh, because uh, because uh, uh, have uh, other uh, I will say in Portuguese é um gênio. But uh, uh, Luís Camões or Fernando Pessoa they are uh, the both great. But I prefer Fernando Pessoa. Well, uh, I'm with you on that one, Sergio. Okay. <laughs> And thank you for distinguishing the TASAS Portugal fac faculty, Sergio, um, by knowing that and, and bailing me out. Uh, I am the typical American who has not yet acquired fluency in a second language, but I promise to work on it. Um, I think so it's we... pretty good, actually. <laughs> uh, so for uh, Sergio again, I think you're winning in the question count here, not that it's a competition. Um, and we've answered this sort of, but this is an early learning center, Dad. Um, at what age do you begin formal Portuguese classes and how frequent are they? Will there be options for Portuguese after school clubs? And how do you deal with the fact that there will be kids ranging from native speakers to complete beginners at each age group? And I agree that the history, culture, language and food of Portugal is wonderful. Okay, we will start with Portugal in the kindergarten four times per week. Um, the groups, uh, normally the groups of 
of uh, no native speakers are different because the students are different, but uh, normally the difference helps uh, the students work because one help other and the other help other. And um, in the end, uh, ooh, I, I thought in create uh, um, a club for write, for creative writing. Uh, so in the end, uh, we will have uh, uh, one club for uh, uh, training the, the, the write. And of course, the speak. Uh, uh. Amy, I'll, I'll just also mention that for pre-kindergarten, ages three and four, we also have Portuguese language, but it's it's integrated into the day of the students. So it's part of their outdoor uh, classroom. It's part of their music. So it's not a formal instruction, but they're getting uh, exposure to Portuguese language every day. Thank you, Keith, for for adding that. Uh, and I've got a question for Bill. Um, and this is from a viewer who saw your lovely wife a few weeks ago uh, when she and her co-teaching partner talked about the developmental milestones for first graders. So why middle school? Why did you choose middle school? And what would be some of the developmental milestones for middle school students? It's a great question. And I think that to really enjoy middle school, you have to love it. And I do. I taught middle school and high school, and I really do love all of the grades I've taught, um, but middle school is 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 a very special time because students are developing um, more quickly, physically um, and psychologically, emotionally than they ever have in their life since they were two or three years old. And so it's a time of huge growth. And as a teacher, one thing I really enjoy is just seeing the difference in a student from beginning to end of year and seeing how much they've grown as a person. Also, of course, how much they've grown reading and writing and, and all of the analytical skills. Some of the some of the features of a middle school that makes middle school age distinct is um, oftentimes physical outpaces the um, emotional maturity. And so students um, sometimes remark about feeling clumsy um, or feeling awkward at times, and that's normal and that's fine. There is a huge increase in ability to problem solve and to think of more abstract concepts. Um, it's really a time when students are starting to develop a worldview. That's an exciting thing to be a part of. Um, it's also quite a big responsibility. Peer pressure is a huge thing. The influence of peers on a student's life increases dramatically during middle school as well too. And I would also say just the need to try on different ideas and perspectives during this time is, is normal and is something that students need to do to figure out um, who they are and where they fit in um, within people in their life and society. All of those things really are things that attract me to teaching middle school because of the amount of growth that students go through. I kind of alluded to this before as well as talking about how a middle school classroom especially has to be one that establishes a real sense of trust and a sense of security for students because during this time, students really feel like the whole world is watching, and that's normal. Um, they're not if you're a middle school student listening in, but that doesn't take away the feeling that you're constantly on stage. And so students need need to reliably know that they can save face in class and have an out when they make a mistake or there's a blunder or something like that, or they trip over their shoes, and those things are fine to be expected. Um, they also, students during this time, really need opportunities to exercise this growing leadership ability and autonomy that they have, and they need clear expectations about how to use that autonomy, uh, autonomy appropriately as well too. And so the classroom environment is, it's really important that it's supportive and safe for students to do that. Thank you very much, Bill. Keith, you look like you have something to add. I always look like I have something to add. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on, on Bill's point of leadership. Our, our middle schoolers are going to be our leaders in this school. They will forever be the oldest students at TASAS Portugal until they graduate, which is a really exciting opportunity, maybe daunting a bit as well, but I plan personally to work closely with that group of students. We need to develop some strong leaders and hopefully all of them will be strong leaders to help guide our younger students, but also help for us to found the school that our students want. We have a lot of ideas about curriculum and academics and sports, but we really need some input from our uh, leading students, but how to create the right culture for this school. And I always say that, you know, schools are made 
uh, for students. They're not made for adults to come to work. They're made for students to come and have a really exciting, invigorating and uh, important education. And so we're going to involve them as much as possible. Um, and so grade sixes and sevens, we encourage you to be ready when you show up in September because we've got high expectations and a lot of fun planned for you. Um, now, Amy, I, I think we're just about out of time because I want to say a few words before we close. Is there another pressing question for the gentleman? Um, well, there are several more questions, and I know that, that you gave me strict instructions not to go over time tonight, so I will keep to that. But for the, the parents who did submit questions, and they're all excellent ones, uh, I apologize, and we will print out those questions, and I will email you uh, the answers to those questions. So apologies we're not answering live, uh, but you know the boss is, is making the rules here. So uh, over to you, Keith. Uh, boss, that's the first time I've heard that. <laughs> um, first, I want to just say to Bruno, I could really use some advice from you. I'm not sure how you pull off a date night without spending any money. So could you please email me some advice on that? Um, no, seriously, I want to say a few words before we close because I, I've been made to understand the government is, is relaxing some restrictions starting this weekend or Monday at the latest. And so I want to encourage people to uh, go easy, first of all. Uh, I know it's been a while since you've had any external human contact. That is with people outside of your family. So um, you may be tempted to grab friends and hold them tightly, perhaps even strangers. I would recommend against that. Uh, and of course, this weekend is Mother's Day. So I want to congratulate all the mothers out there in the audience. Uh, for without you, none of us would have jobs. Uh, and really, teaching is the best job in the world. We all love what we do, and we love working with our families. For me, I want to thank the most inspirational person in my life, my mother, Doreen Shaquin. Uh, I'm trying to follow the selfless, the selfless selfless example you set for me and to leave the world in a little bit better place so thank you and lastly to my mother-in-law uh, you know marge you need to cut me some slack i know nobody's good enough for your daughter but i'm doing my best okay but we love you both uh, i want to say good night now fire in your questions to amy she'll make sure bill and sergio get them if you have more and of course we will see you next Thursday back here for Coffee with Keith, version 6. Have a safe night, everyone.